Thank you for listening to SPN, the Savage Podcasting Network. You're listening to the Stephen Savage Show on the Savage Podcasting Network. And now here's your host, film and television director, Stephen Savage. Thank you, Andrea. How you doing, everybody? Savage here with you for yet another episode of the Stephen Savage Show, the official podcast of the Idlewild International Festival of Cinema, coming up quick, March 7th through the 12th, and uh, the Scotland International Festival of Cinema, which returns for its second season April 18th through the 23rd in People, Scotland. As usual, we're coming to you from Cranium Wheel Studios at Chateau Esteban in beautiful Idlewild, California, just Two hours east of Los Angeles, but a world away at just under 6,000 feet, high atop Mount San Jacinto, and overlooking the Great Coachella Valley. And again, a reminder to look out for some very exciting guests on deck in the coming weeks, including a return to the podcast of my friend Oscar and Golden Globe-nominated actress Ann Archer, and one of the stars of HBO's Westworld and the new ABC hit series Alaska Daily. And of course, she's also the voice of Disney's Pocahontas, my friend Irene Bedard. So look out for those episodes coming up. And speaking of the Scotland Film Festival, my guest today serves as a grand jury member of the Scotland International Festival of Cinema and is well known to movie and TV fans for his many roles in blockbuster movies like uh, Mel Gibson's Braveheart, where he starred as Robert the Bruce, a role which he reprised in 2019 in the epic motion picture Robert the Bruce. Uh, the Lost City of Z, which is on Amazon right now. It's so uh, I just got a chance to see it for the first time a few months ago, and I loved it. And one of my favorite characters this guy's played when he took on the uh, role of Orson Welles in the Tim Robbins-directed all-star cast film Cradle Will Rock. Uh, his many and varied television roles of what, as well have made him... Uh, one of the most prolific actors on either side of the Atlantic, and I'm just happy to call him my friend and have him on the show. So let me welcome in Scottish native and one of my favorite actors and <laughs> the one and only Angus McFadden. Angus, thanks for taking the time to come on, man. Appreciate it. Uh, no no worries at all. It's good to to uh, sometimes chat. Yeah. <laughs> Get it all out. <laughs> <laughs> just <laughs> just to allow yourself the freedom to just say what you feel. So uh, <laughs> where where are you at the moment? I, I hear a lot of birds in the background. I know you've been bouncing back and forth across the pond a lot, but where are you calling from uh, right now? Um, well, I'm I'm on an island uh, uh, off the coast of Panama, mm-hmm. where I've been living for the last um, 20, 20 years now. Wow. See, that's nice to be able to have that kind of the ability to just live somewhere like that where you don't have to be. I try to stay out of like Los Angeles as much as I can. It's not always possible, but <laughs> I do. Um, I know you've been spending as much time in, uh, in your schedule as will we'll allow with your little girl. And I know she's a big part, part of your life. So um, the ability to balance career with something as special as a young daughter and living on an island, that has to be pretty fulfilling for you. Um, yeah, I mean, I try to spend as much time as I can here. It's just uh, uh, beneficial for my health, you know. It's uh, clean air and uh, uh, rainwater and the ocean. And I, I uh, go and take my dogs to the ocean every day and get in that mm. great big, uh, it's, you know, it feels like the love of God, really, when you're in it. It's uh, living kind of a Hemingway lifestyle, and that's, that's always been something I've wanted. To, you know, I just kind of keep to yourself as much as possible and keep your head straight and then when you have to leave your paradise and get back into the real world to work or whatever it's always nice to to know that you're yeah. you've recharged your battery a little bit so uh you and i got yeah. to spend uh, some time together during the scotland international film festival last april I, I remember the last night of the fest you and i left a large dinner party thing and just started walking through a very drizzly night to back to our uh, respective hotels, casting these Sherlock Holmes-like shadows on the stone walls. And uh, two things, I had a great time just hanging out with you, talking movies and acting, but you also taught me a lot about whiskey. I thought I was an expert until I spent a few days with you. And... Oh, well, you were you were mixing it with Coca-Cola, which is just, <laughs> it's just sort of, you know, you just, you can't do that in Scotland. Yeah, you changed my life when you hit me upside 
by the end. Told me to start that. Start yeah. doing that. It was that, just but... like get get off the red label and uh, you know at least you know with a, a single malt and like <laughs> just uh, enjoy it. Yeah. Uh, well, again, no, I, no sugar hangovers. <laughs> that's right. I changed my ways. I did after that. But one thing I really liked was that the fact that you know you there's a few of my friends who are like this, but you're sort of one of those throwbacks to the old Hollywood a little bit you know that old school energy the what I imagine the Humphrey Bogart Walter Houston Hemingway thing as we mentioned you know throwing back shots talking acting in pubs and out of the way little villages in the UK I love that and I found I found you were a, a kindred spirit in many ways and I really had a great time that week so thanks again for coming out to the festival that was really nice of you yeah well I mean some of my, I mean my acting heroes all belong to the old school you know the the i i love uh, albert finney and mm -hmm. richard harris and um and you know anthony hawkins these guys who you know they were they were uh peter o'toole you know they were great raconteurs mm -hmm. not that i am one unless you've got a few drinks in me but um <laughs> you know it's uh it's uh, that's that's uh the the old school and those great performances by those guys back in the 50s 60s you know and mm -hmm. going into the 70s of course is the golden age mm -hmm. um and you know to, it, it often feels like we were just born a little too late isn't that the truth know, yeah that's absolutely the way i feel i would love to go back and and just spend an afternoon with oliver reed and steve mcqueen and just hang you know i think that would be great oh, so. i don't know if I, I i think i might draw the line at oliver reed oh would you <laughs> 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 it's so he and uh I think he and Keith Moon of The Who were of the same ilk, <laughs> so maybe they were a little over the top, but still interesting stories. Um, I like to start my interviews by giving my listeners a chance to learn about the background of my guests, and even though uh, your diehard fans probably know a lot about your growing up, etc., some of my listeners, even those who know your work, of course, would be fascinated to hear about you. You've had a very interesting upbringing. You grew up basically traveling the world. Um, if you don't mind, tell me, uh, tell us about your beginnings leading up to your amazing acting career. What what was growing up like for Angus McFadden? Uh, well, I mean, I, 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 my dad was in World Health Organization, which meant um, I spent four years in Africa, then three years in Singapore. Uh, then I went to England for a year, mm -hmm. um, uh, just outside of London. Then I was off to... Australia, then the South Pacific, the place called, um, at the time it was called um, Port Villa, but now it's called Vanuatu. Mm -hmm. um, then I went off to uh, France, Switzerland, Denmark. And so, you know, I kind of got, I got used to moving around a lot and, and having to uh, sort of be self-sufficient, um, which meant that I, I, I spent a lot of time by myself drawing and uh, developing those skills mm -hmm. um, um, and, and being quite sort of internal in some way and, and that you know eventually led to acting because you know in school it was like something I could just do it was something which you know they said you you have a talent for it and, and as opposed to other people so mm -hmm. I kind of fell into that but then I went to, uh, I did law in France for a year, which I wasn't very good at studying the Napoleonic Code uh, <laughs> at university. And, um, but there was a woman involved. So then I left her and went to Edinburgh and was studying international relations. And then I, a little voice said to me, you know, get, stop doing that and do something else. And I didn't, I, I just listened to the voice and changed over to English and French literature and language and did 35 plays while I was at Edinburgh. Wow. And, um, and you know, that, kind of, and then I went to drama school for three years, at Central School in London. Mm -hmm. So that kind of changed my direction, listening to that voice. And it was quite good because in the end, you know, I would have probably become a politician and I would have been in that <laughs> Labour government when they invaded uh, <laughs> Iraq back in 2003. And, and I would probably... Um, I hope to think I would have been one of the people who would have quit, mm -hmm. you know, for principle and then, you know, not had a job. But, uh, uh, you know, a lot of people didn't. And, you know, we sort of live with the the, the very unethical world that we live in these days of polit politics and 
And so, uh, you know, I, I feel like I've escaped the grasp in some way of of all that and held on to my soul, I think. Yeah, I think that we're always drawn to what we're supposed to do. You know, it's um, you're talking about studying in London. You know, American actors are somewhat jealous of the training that British actors are exposed to. There's so many great acting schools in the UK. But was uh, going to, to uh, leaving Edinburgh and going to the to school in London was that a happenstance, or would you, was there actually a calculated thing that you thought London is the place I need to be? Yeah, I guess I just sort of went, uh, you know, I've done that now, and I really do like the acting, so I'll go to the school. And, um, I mean, the major reason I went even to Central was it was the cheapest school. It was the uh -huh. best one. Uh -huh. um, you know, Olivier and Vanessa <clears throat> Redgrave and um, uh, Jared Harris, just a lot of people went there. Mm -hmm. But, you know, it was only £450 a year for the tuition wow. at the time. Wow. Um, which was the cheapest place. So I went, oh, I can afford that i'll go and get a job in a pub and pay it off mm -hmm. and so you know and of course now it's like 20 25 000 pounds a year you know mm -hmm. not the way it goes so it's, <laughs> it's sort of uh, out of reach of a lot of people but back then it was it was um it was fantastic and you were able to live in a find a little room in a in a in a in a dump with a bunch of other actors uh, for <laughs> 25 quid a week mm -hmm. and then we found out that the house the, the entire apartment on the bottom floor was had been shut down so we broke into it uh, <laughs> and 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 closed it up from in the front and turned on the electricity and we lived there for two years free <laughs> so it was good it, we, you know you remember these days of when you had nothing and you right. were just a, a study a, a student you know living with uh, very little but they're actually sort of the it's it's that old monty python sketch of you, you know the luxury i used to live in a paper bag you know and the <laughs> kids these days don't know nothing right. you know and but it is a little like that you, you remember those times as as very happy times yeah any actor like a musician if you haven't if you haven't squatted at least once in your life <laughs> you're not you know you don't it, that's those are the experiences i remember Tori Amos talking about some songwriter who was just her music, everybody was touting it as being so raw. And Tori Amos said, if you've never been to a laundromat, then you, you can't write songs. <laughs> and that was, yeah, that uh, <laughs> acting is, uh, yeah, yeah, that's right. It's the same thing. Yeah. If you don't have those life experiences, and many of the best life experiences are the ones that find you pretty down and destitute but at the time you're not really thinking of yourself as down and destitute because you're doing what you love to do that's what i've always it's seen. somehow romantic and, yeah. and also you can handle it because you're you're young right and you have all of these hopes and dreams and it's it's just a it's a stepping stone you know it's mm -hmm. like and it's also it's just it's it's food right for 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 characters you'll play or things you'll write it's 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 all part of it yeah you can't live in a bubble, you know. We then then we get into the bubble when we, you know, if people make too much money, they they end up living in a bubble and completely disconnected. Right. Somebody had said something about accents, and um, actors will pick up an accent and say, "I do this really great uh, sort of mid Glamorgan Welsh accent." And you well, you you <coughs> do that because you picked it up from a movie. You've never actually had that experience, so you're actually just taking some other actors. Uh, uh, hard work trying to pick up an accent and you just use that yeah and so and i'm you, always doing that with uh, tony montana you know yeah <laughs> everybody's got their tony montana man. that's right and they're and they're christopher okay. walk and everybody's got oh, one yeah. of those what yeah. what was your first movie um and do you remember how that came about i mean it's so much different than doing stage work to all of a sudden find yourself on a movie set so what was the what was the first film you did um, it was a BBC film uh, which I got cast in, and so I, I actually ended up leaving drama school early, a, mm -hmm. a term early, um, to do this uh, uh, film with uh, Brian Cox playing my father. Oh, okay. Eileen Atkins is my mother. Mm -hmm. So you know, and uh, John Schlesinger was in the movie, and uh, wow. Rene Auberge Noir. So it was like a really fun uh, experience for like four weeks for w which i then found out i was getting paid 50 quid a day uh -huh. even though i was the lead and the extras are getting paid 100 quid a day <laughs> it's like how does this work 
<laughs> that's yeah i mean it's so funny how like your first movie is your best ex your best training ground now you left school to do this movie and you learn not only what a film set is all about but you also learn the film business can be pr pretty brutal at times yeah <laughs> they, when you find out the extras are getting paid more and probably eating better <laughs> Um, my, yeah. my, my audience, of course, is going to be interested in Braveheart. I know you ask, you're, you answer these questions all the time, so I hope it doesn't get too hectic or boring or whatever. But, but I know everyone will want to know how that came about. It was such a huge, big budget, big box office epic. And you'd been doing movies, you know, before that, of course. But, um, it must have been felt amazing to, first of all, you're working with Mel Gibson, but to have such a pivotal role in the film as Robert the Bruce. Um, yeah. Did you have any idea the film would be so big? I mean, I remember Gibson himself saying he had his doubts he could even pull it off, such a huge undertaking, yeah. <laughs> directing and starring. But did anyone on the set really have a grasp on how huge it tur would turn out to be, and how did you actually land that role? Well, I mean, we, we actually... Uh, I, I can't remember if we were maybe a, two months in or a month in, and they had this trailer where they said, come and see... Uh, We've edit, edited together the ending. Mm -hmm. And, we'll, you know, from uh, me on the horse with all of the guys right. and the sword being thrown and the char. And we watched like this 15 minute thing and they had the music to um, uh, the mission on it by Ennio Morricone. Right. And it was so moving. And we all walked out and went, wow, that's pretty special. Mm -hmm. Wow, we're in something here. Right. Because we were all like, what the hell? And I said, yeah, but I mean, how are they going to improve on the music? <laughs> <laughs> and lo and behold, they did. You know that score is is uh, is one of the greatest things that that uh, musician ever wrote. Right. Um, um, so that's how we realized that we were in something special. I, I got the job. Um, I went in to meet him. I hadn't worked for nine months, and the casting director called me. Said, "Now you're coming in for the English Prince, and I know you're no, you're not going to want it. You want to play Robert the Bruce. Right. You'll want to." But forget it. It's already cast. Mm -hmm. So I, I drank two bottles of red wine at lunch <laughs> and got on the train to go over there uh, and went in. And I, see, I'm lucky I'm Scott. So, you know, I may, I may have drank two bottles, but I don't slur. I, it doesn't sound like it. <laughs> right. So I was basically talking for an hour and a half. And he was like, so let's talk about the English prince, you know. And I said, I don't want to talk about him. I want to talk about Robert the Bruce. Mm-hmm because it's my role and I know you've already cast it, but I'm going to give you my ideas and my thoughts on it. And I, I was in there for like an hour and a half talking about him. And he said, you sh at the end, he went, okay, you sure you don't want to talk? I said, no, I'm good. Thanks. Yeah. And I left and kicking myself all the way home. Cause I'd, you know, just probably lost the job. Mm -hmm. Um, and then I got a call 10 days later, um, come back. And he said, you want the role? And I said, hell yeah. And it turned out that the other actor um, who had been cast let the day go by by which he should have accepted the offer, so they withdrew it. Hmm. Mel withdrew it and gave it to me because I'd convinced him. And the other guy was trying to get the role in the other Scottish film playing the Tim Roth role, so we lost out on that too. Right. But he's done extremely well since I'm not going to mention his name, but he's, he's done very well. Well, it's, it's no safety net sometimes is just the way to go. Yeah, you could have lost the role, but you didn't. So in hindsight, you know, that worked out. Yeah. Having passion, <clears throat> people read that, you know. Casting directors are just like anybody else. They'll they'll have their certain ideas about yeah. what role, but when you bring passion to the table, they see it, man. Yes. They know. So Well, sometimes they're afraid of it. Like I I I've, I've used it a few times again mm -hmm. and I got several roles just sort of insisting Mm -hmm. that I get a meeting even though they didn't want to meet me. Um, one was the Orson Welles film. The other one was the, uh, the Yaya yeah Sisterhood. They just didn't want to meet me, and I right. and I, I insisted on a meeting. Um, but, you know, it also doesn't work sometimes. I, I tried to get the uh, a role which DiCaprio was up for, was, you know, on the phone insisting on it, and, you know, it didn't go anywhere, and I probably, you know, scared a few people off. But you know you've got to be who you are mm -hmm. and like you know take take chances 
Well, yeah, I mean, I I think that any successful actor will tell you that sometimes they've stuck their neck, neck out on the on the block and it's worked for them. And the times that it does work, even if it doesn't work five times, but it works once and it turns out to work in a big film that you really love. Well, who's yeah. lost there? You know, I know Braveheart was re-released. Uh, to be more in line with the Oscar contention. And uh, that turned out to be a great strategy, too. Um, the, everything down the line with that film just to seemed to be gold, you know, and it, it just had to have been exciting to be such a big part of that film. We, yeah, it was definitely... He, he has a lot of passion. Yeah. I've never met anybody with as much passion um, as Mel. Mm -hmm. You know, he really... He really puts it all on the line, and... He, you know, I've never seen somebody one day he just didn't like the scene we were doing and he shut down the entire production and we sat down for four hours and went over the scene and rewrote it. And like the entire production shut down and I've never, in, that was like 30 years ago and I've never seen anybody do it since. Yeah. It's, uh, I've, to me, that's, I've heard about, you know, actor friends of mine who worked with Costner, it's the same thing. These actors oh, yeah. bring that that energy. It's their their names on the line, and they're going to make sure it's perfect. And it really elevates yeah. everybody else. You know, the performances in yeah. that is just phenomenal. That's funny because I I literally just worked with him, and 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 it was so re relieving because when you work in TV, mm -hmm. um, there's always this sort of the time factor hanging over. Mm -hmm. You, you know, and not just that they've got that schedule to get the thing in eight days, but they've got, you know, uh, whatever the, the thing is, 42 minutes or 50 minutes of, mm -hmm. the, of each, you know, because they got commercials, whatever. So they, you know, they're always saying to you, speed it up. Can you do sure. that? But just like faster. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you go, yeah, sure, because you, you want them to keep the scene in and everything. But mm -hmm. it's always a bit soul destroying, you know. Yeah. And so it was great to go on this film with Costner. And he like walked through the beats mm -hmm. for me, and I was like, "I should take that long." And he was like, "Yeah, man." <laughs> and I was like, "Cool, this is like you're like telling me to like not say anything for three minutes in the scene and like <laughs> you, and not rush it." Yeah, he's like, "No, don't rush it, man." Yeah. And it was like, oh, yeah, we're making a movie. We're doing westerns here. <laughs> it was a lot. Yeah, it's like night and day TV and movies. But what I liked about going back to Braveheart real quick was just Spielberg does this all the time. He's a master of it. But I think Mel Gibson was able to take that big, big, expensive blockbuster, lots of cast and hundreds of thousands of extras but still pull a personal story out of it. And that's amazing to me when you see those guys. And the reason is... I think letting the I'll tell you one of my favorite smaller scenes in Braveheart was between you and uh and um Mel Gibson and and he's basically telling you look stop following stop doing what your dad says everybody will follow you all fucking follow you you know and there's a that moment That was the scene we rewrote. Is That's that right? The scene we rewrote. Your yeah. eyes in that he just holds on you just to let the audience go wow he really touched this guy which of course leads to the following scene when you you know the, the scene a few a few minutes later where you betray him on the battlefield that makes that scene yeah. more powerful because of that moment and uh yeah. a director especially a, a movie star director who will take the time and not make it about just himself and how heroic his character is but to give the other yeah. characters around him that time to show something so he really That's takes right. reaches in takes the heart of robert the bruce at that minute looks right at it and says get your shit together mate that's great that's brilliant storytelling i think and you know he is such a pro that you know he's not only directing producing mm -hmm. uh, doing the rewriting and all of this but also playing that role so that you know it would come to his takes and he would never do more than two. He would do one, and he would get it absolutely right, whatever he was doing, mm -hmm. like the tear running down his face when he realized, realizes I've betrayed him. Mm -hmm. He did that in the first take, and then he said, okay, one for safety, and he did it exactly the same again. Wow. And, so, and then he moves on, so he's got the time for all of these other, you know, most of us were inexperienced actors, you know, we'd never really done something like this. Mm -hmm. So he, he was creating, you know, carving out time for for the rest of us by being a pro and not being egotistical or mm -hmm. you know uh 
oh, what about me? You know, my performance. He 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 kind of has an attitude, which is he actually kind of hates himself as an actor. Yeah. So he 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 can't bear watching himself, and you know he he talks it down, but you know he gets the job done, right. and you know he knows what he's doing, but he, he doesn't see himself necessarily as a great actor and anything. You know, as we've seen, he, he's he's a his his real gift is in directing. Yeah, he's uh, there are some who got like Robert Redford, who I like a lot of Redford films, but he's no director. Yeah. He's no director, and I watch him and I go, ah, oh. yeah. And but then you watch, uh, you know, you watch Braveheart, or you watch what's the the man the man with the guy has a uh, wrecked face. I can't remember. It was something about yeah. anyway, you watch that. That was kind of his first directing thing. He was kind of learning about. Yeah, directing. that's right. And um, then all of a sudden when he did Hamlet, you could see he'd gotten his spurs on and he had his legs underneath him and he was ready to go. And that's, a, you know, for Shakespeare to come off on screen like yeah. that was really good. I think I, I personally think he was miscast as, as Hamlet. He's, he's a Henry V. You know, yeah, I can. I need, I've always... need somebody more. I'm not going to say tortured because Mel's pretty tortured. He's got <laughs> a lot of that going on, but right. it's just like he, he's got that face, which you just like. Wait a minute, that's Mad Max. He yeah. he acts. Right. He doesn't like think about it and get all screwed up about it. He mm -hmm. he he. You know, that's how we know him as a Henry V, as yeah. a as a William Wallace or Mad Max. An action figure, guy, you know? an action guy who yeah, takes like, that. Yeah, takes... He, he'll deliver it. He'll right. just he'll rise above his weaknesses. Whereas there are certain actors who are really good at exploring the weaknesses. Yeah, of what it is, what you know, before they became a hero, like Robert the Bruce is that kind of a character. Right. There was so much complexity in Robert the Bruce, and I've watched that. You know that your caricature in that uh, in Braveheart, and I watch it with other people who don't. First of all, don't know history at all, but they've all just there are things that just capture them, and they also like if they don't know you know history, they don't know that you're actually Robert the Bruce or what that means to history. And they say the brown guy. Yeah. I I like the brown guy. I know he'll come through. I know he's going to be good. You know, and then they get real frustrated. But I'm I'm thinking about little moments that I don't know how much of it was blocked or but there's one scene where you're waiting for him to show up in Edinburgh you're waiting for William Wallace yeah. and when he finally comes someone said he's here and you do this little yeah. jump off the table and it just says so much about the character and it tells us he's ready to become a good man again you know just really yeah. ready to step into himself and then everybody's betrayed you know he they take Wallace yeah. and you have nothing to do with it but that little jump off the table and I go that's what acting's all about. It can be a scratch of the nose. It can be just that little thing that tells us what's coming 30 seconds later. Yeah. You know, I just, I love that sort of uh, spontaneous acting like that. There's so few that can do well, it. I remember that day very well because he, we, I went in and, you know, Mel would always say, okay, so here's the room. And, and he can't, you know, as an actor like Kevin, he, he likes to act it out for people to mm -hmm. show them. You know, mm -hmm. here's my idea. And then, and you know, sometimes you go with his idea because it, cause it's just like perfect. Mm -hmm. But sometimes it's not, you know, it's like you've got a character. And he said, so you're leaning on this chair waiting for me. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, this is my table, isn't it? And he went, yeah. I said, and this is my castle. And he went, yeah. And I've been waiting for you for how long? And he, like two weeks. He mm -hmm. said, yeah, like two weeks, a week maybe. And I said, okay. So I'm going to get on my table and walk up and down it because yeah. it's my table. It's my castle. I'm, I'm the future king. I, right. There's a certain arrogance, you right. know, a certain, like, just taking you out of it. And he, he's also going a little mad with the weight. Yeah. You know? So, so but, you know, uh, if you try that stuff in TV, people get afraid mm -hmm. and they go, no, I think we should just, you know, and, and it's often can be quite frustrating. Whereas he just went, he took a beat. And he went, he turned to his camera and said, okay, put the camera right down here on the table looking up. And that was that. There was no argument. He, he allowed you the freedom, you know, to, mm -hmm. to, to, to make the right choices. Yeah, and he knew it was in his mind as soon as you said it. He knew it was going to work. Well, he's kind of fearless. He's yeah, fearless. And yeah. what you often encounter, uh, you know, in, in, in uh, TV making or filmmaking by committee is is it's all just fear mm. 
Well, it's funny and because so you're... so you know you don't really want to fight that too much because you get the you get the um, uh, you're labeled as a difficult actor, you know. And, yeah, of and course. You just you've got to be careful and and pick the right battles to fight. There's such a correlation with what you just said, though. That this is this is Robert the Bruce's castle. It's my table. I'm going to walk on it. Same thing that Gibson's going. Yeah, it's my movie. It's my table. He's going to walk on it. It's, it's just good yeah. stuff. But there was so much childlike exuberance in that that it just said a lot about where your character would come from point A to point B just in that one moment. And then it that makes, yeah. when they capture Wallace, it makes it all the more cha- uh, uh, tragic. And I think that those little, yes. those little moves that don't really telegraph, but they later we think about them going, wow, it's amazing that that led up to this. Um this moment and it just it made it all the more as a director i just look at things like that and say man i wish i'd have thought of that i wish that had been something i thought of and it's it's really not a a jealous thing it's more of a man i really appreciate that work and uh speaking of taking roles and turning down roles and all that the the movie i talked about earlier that i really liked was the lost city of z and as an actor that was not a that's not a heroic role of course by any stretch as an actor are those roles fun to play or are you looking for something that i've had actors tell me the reason they've done a money a movie of mine for less than what their agent would of course wanted was because it's a role they've never played before like i put somebody it's a, a western and put somebody on a horse and i just always wanted to do a western so you can get actors that way but when you choose a role like that, was that something you knew you could bite into a guy that was so despicable and make him work within the story? Is that ever an interest to you to take on roles that perhaps yeah. you know are not the, the well? I mean, Robert I never Bruce. look at them. I, I never look at a character as despicable. I, I I try to find out who they were. And the interesting about this that man, he actually existed, mm-hmm. and he he was a, an explorer and an adventurer. And he went also to the Antarctic or the North Pole. I can't remember which one, uh-huh. you know, and, 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 you know, discovered some stuff and did quite well, you know, and, and I, and I, what I realized was that this guy was, was better in cold climates. He could endure the cold, mm-hmm. but once he went to the, he made the mistake of going into the tropic into the tropics and he could not handle the heat. Mm. And it's it's a whole different beast, the heat and the cold. Mm-hmm. And people just like fall apart in the heat, right. and whereas they can handle extreme cold. So that was my, you know, the, the entire thing of that was not ever thinking of him, just thinking of him as a human being who can't handle that environment. Right. And he falls apart. After watching your portrayal, I I dug into the Wikipedia and everything else to learn more about that guy, all the, you know, the major characters in that story. But, yeah, that's what I've, I've, well, you know, sometimes storytelling, we we tend to make certain characters a little worse than they may have been. And that's an interesting, you know, point where you're saying this guy just had this aversion to the heat that he didn't even know that it would happen until he actually got into the situation. And sometimes history is not as kind to people as it should be because we don't think about things like that. You know, I don't know if you got to spend much time with Leslie Patterson at the film festival. I know you guys were talking a little bit, um, you know, her film, All Quiet on the Western Front, which she co-wrote and executive yeah. produced uh, 14 BAFTAs and nine Academy Awards. Isn't Award that amazing? Award. It's amazing. For such a great person as her, too, you know. But she and I, were yeah. ta- we were talking about you and these, these future projects that we're lining up right now. She's got a couple she's shooting in the U.K., and I have a couple I'm shooting here in the States. And we're both, you know, just right now we're just in the process of developing like four or five together at the same time. And, you you know, we were talking about you and and getting to spend time with you at Scotland and everything really made me even more anxious to work with you. Watching your work on the screen is one thing, but just, you know, I'm, I'm not a fan of these taped auditions. I like to see people come into yeah. a room and I'm just more of a fan of that. But uh, spending time with, with you like, like she and I both did, um, yeah, I'm just really anxious to get some work in with you and you're just, you have a way of playing so many different roles. You know, uh, Orson Welles is so different from, from Robert the Bruce and, uh, yeah. big hero of mine. And I thought you did such a great job. 
especially your interaction with like John Hausman and and <laughs> I just loved every bit of that movie. Uh it was it was just great, but I like I like uh actors like you who just are able to kind of take the bull by the horns and bring something to the table and make each role a little different and I'm you know, I'd, I'd like to dive in a little bit on Equilibrium, in which you star with like, oh, yeah. uh, Christian Bale and Sean Bean. Uh, I think Emily Watson's yeah. in that movie. Such a great cast. Interesting film. Um, uh, Kurt Wimmer was the director, I believe. How yes. did how'd that come about for you, that film? And, and that seemed a little quirky for things that you've done in the past. And was that something that you just want? You saw the role and went, yeah, it's something a little different. I mean, I... I... You know, the, I, I've, I'm a little disappointed with that movie. I, mm. I know a lot of people like it, mm -hmm. and it was a precursor to to many things which have been made since mm -hmm. with that idea. But there was just something which which missed f for me in, in any case. That's and interesting. I don't know what it. I don't know what it was. Um, it always well. I, I know it was a it was a box office failure because they never did any. Right. Um, they never did any uh, publicity for it whatsoever, mm -hmm. and they kind of dumped it. I don't know what what the reason was for it. So maybe that's what what really bothered me. Um, I found it accidentally. But, uh, you know, after I met you, I found out. You know, and I went and looked at the movie. So yeah, I, it wasn't. I didn't hear anything about it. I don't think they did any kind of push at all. No, nothing at all. But but you know, and and this was uh, you know, Christian Bale was was just sort of coasting that the beginning of that wave and mm -hmm. so it was, seemed like a stupid uh, decision mm -hmm. but it's had a cult following since so right, it's, right. it's done quite well i've had a lot but of i do remember that uh, we we you know we um i remember the wine stuff they they we were about to start filming and then there was some problem with the script and 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 bob weinstein turned up and we had to all do a reading in a room and maybe they were going to just cancel the whole film and while we were all already in berlin and mm -hmm. Maybe that kind of set a sort of sense of paranoia to the whole thing. I don't know, because hmm. it was just sort of rude to to make us, you know, we'd all been offered the roles, and then we have to do a reading for Bob Weinstein in the room, who kind of looked at his at his script and never once looked up at anybody, and it just seemed all rather humiliating and demeaning. Yeah. Um, I don't know. The business sometimes can be just so it's they're dealing with artists and half of these suits are so they don't even know they're dealing with artists. They actually think that because they're the guys who bring in some money, they're the ones that people are going to see at the box office. Like, no, we're not here to yeah. see your money. We're here to see great performances and a good script. And it's a quirky film. But, yeah, the, I know I teach first year directors at AFI and, and a lot of young yeah. director, a lot of young directors, male and female, talk about that movie because. Um, OK. You know, Wimmer's off the wall. He makes a lot of the futuristic stuff and all that. But, um, yeah, it, it's give the movie another look because it may be, you know, because it wasn't pushed yeah. or anything. Nowadays, it's, it's got a lot of interest. People, especially young filmmakers, seem to connect with that in in a lot of ways. Really? Yeah, so it's something. Yeah, I, I remember because I was like, there seem to be sort of contradictions in it. Like, nobody's supposed to feel anything, mm -hmm. but there's... Um, I can't remember the name of the actor who opposite um, opposite Christian and he's discovered that uh, he's been keeping all of these uh, uh, you know books and paintings and, and mm. he's triumphant over it but he's not supposed to be feeling right. anything so yeah. why is he triumphant at that moment why am I screaming stuff when I'm supposed to have no emotion because <laughs> we're all supposed to be on this drug yeah so it's sort of like there were a lot of big loopholes, and, and the little puppy really annoyed me too. That was just too <laughs> manipulative. Yeah. You know, things, you know, it's like sometimes when you see a script, you don't really see the, the how big the hole is because it, it takes putting it on screen to see that it's a giant hole. Yeah. Where uh, people just can't connect because it, it, it didn't really appear to be that big on the page. Mm. I've watched movies like that. Now that you think about it, I mean, yeah, you've changed my mind. I hate that movie. No, I'm kidding. It's like, but there was a there was a, <laughs> there was a film called The Three Billboards in something. I forget what it was called. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I like that. Uh, I didn't like it at first. I had to go back and watch it again. There was so much. I thought uh, Dinklage, Peter Dinklage, was wasted yes. in that movie. Such a fine actor, and he was just, you know, it was like some. It was like the director was a friend of his and threw him in because he knew he could and he could ride that Game of Thrones. Uh, 
Thrones wave or something. But oh yeah, yeah, I just thought he was wasted in that movie, and um, and the ending got didn't get me at all and then I went back after hearing other people say you know you really need to watch it again and I did and a couple things still bugged me but overall I thought the film had much more merit than I had originally given it credit for but speaking of yeah. Game of Thrones Game of Thrones I it may I may be wrong but I heard that you were offered something in Game of, Game of Thrones but turned it down is that a f- complete lie or fabrication or what I wasn't really available I was doing it was unfortunate that I, I was doing a, a play in Los Angeles, which was paying me nothing, so uh-huh. my dates were uh, 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 didn't coincide. So mm. there I was getting paid a hundred bucks a night for doing this right this uh, play Medea, and I, I missed out on that. Uh, it happens, but you committed to something and you followed through, and you know what can you do? I mean, that's the way it goes. But <coughs> I'm going to drop some names here because you've start, you know, you've played alongside some very big names in Hollywood. It's like, uh, what's my list here somewhere? Like Sandra Bullock, uh, Matt Damon, Scarlett Johansson, of course, the aforementioned Mill Gip- Gibson and Christian Bale. Uh, did you ever believe when you started out that you'd be working among cali- that caliber of actors? Did you have that much confidence in yourself? when you're living when you're squatting in, in, in some abandoned building yeah lots of people get yeah. the the occasional walk on or guest star term but you've constantly been cast among some of the cream of the crop actors if you will and do you still look around at your career and say wow the kid's done all right for himself and does acting in big hollywood movies still hold a thrill for you as an actor um well i i, I would say that I did have the uh, have the confidence back then, mm-hmm. even though I was living in rags. But you know, you 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 do it because you have the confidence. Like you you surrender everything mm-hmm. for for your dream, and you say, "I'm not taking anything less." So you kind of expect it. It's it's kind of a madness. And then um, I guess slowly over time, you know, you uh, maybe you start to. Uh, you know the dream changes in some way because it can never f- completely fulfill you you've got to you know i don't know what it is a lot of people need a family and 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 and, and you got to sort of focus on different things so mm-hmm. in the end it's good because it's a bit you, you put some money in 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 the bank and you you kind of make sure you're okay mm-hmm. hopefully <laughs> um you know i yeah. mean working actors you know they they always you know we we, we uh we survive on the residuals mm-hmm and um you know off big movies and tv shows so it's a good thing that we have that you, you know the union in america which which um at least pays you know the uk stuff doesn't pay right yeah i've heard that complaint you, you do a lot. Uh, you do a tv show there and they take they take all seven years of the residuals right isn't that ridiculous? Makes no sense. It's out, it's outrageous. Yeah. How dare they? People complain about the Screen Actors Guild, but when you look at other countries and how they treat their actors, it's uh, it, a lot of people are very grateful for the Screen Actors Guild. You know, they they do take... tell me, and they, they they gave me my pension and mm-hmm. my and these residuals, and the UK guys gave me nothing. They yeah. just took it. Yeah. They're like they they took all of the, the residuals, and for a film like Braveheart and all of these things, it's like. Yeah, it, it's really not, and it hasn't changed. You know, yeah, it has not changed in thirty years. It's like people are still expected to work for peanuts, right? When you're doing, you know, I don't want to change the subject too much here because I have a lot to say about that. But it's, you know, I don't want to keep you forever. But um, I could go on and on about unions and equity and all that stuff. But you've done a lot of. Uh, I would call them costume per- epics, you know, period pieces. Are those easy for you to do? I mean, you've probably had all the combat training you're going to need in your life. And, you know, you re- revised your Braveheart role in that film uh, we mentioned earlier, Robert the Bruce, which I thought, I when I heard you sh- you guys shot a lot of it in Montana, I was like really thrilled about that. But uh, I enjoyed the movie very much. But is your approach to a role like one of those big sort of heroic things involves a lot of heavy fur and armor <laughs> swords and muskets or whatever um as opposed to playing like modern characters does it really do you do you do you approach every role pretty much the same inside out it's a big no i mean when you do a historical thing that you've got that whole period you can Mm -hmm. you know i like it because you could go get a bunch of books and watch watch a bunch of stuff and like 
try and get your head into what life was like then, mm -hmm. you know, yeah, and what what was going on in the world. And it's actually an education. You, you learn things about periods you would never have learned about. Sure. And so I love it for that because you know that that's a a, a major part of. Uh, of, of what I do is like research and, and you know and it's just like this wonderful moment where you start to prepare for a role and you slowly you're sort of like a bird of prey like a, mm -hmm. a hawk or something and you're circling the the role from high above and you, you know you don't go in for the kill until you're shooting yeah on the day and that's when it all like centers and enters you and they call action and it's you know you have to have the emotion right there but that emotion has months of work behind it and, and thought and and imaginings mm -hmm. and so it's a it's a wonderful process you know it's artistic and creative and that's you know what keeps me alive in some ways you know mm -hmm. uh, from day to day is just you know you can have the luxury of that i have so much stuff that i would i i my notes here about what to ask you are just i would keep you for two hours i love talking and the way you <laughs> speak about acting you know i could talk to you about more about period films and and um you know there was a movie called shadow heart i do a lot of uh, i do a lot of westerns oh, yeah. i have done and i thought that movie was interesting and i thought you have all the makings of a western star and that's one of the things i was speaking about with um with um, Leslie Patterson about we have a couple of outdoor uh, all American epic you know kind of period pieces and I, would you like to do more westerns? It seems like you like you know you 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 kind of dig into the horseback riding thing and you just seem natural in it. You know this, um, I you just have that vibe. You have it's almost I don't want to say it, but I'm going to. You've got that American western star vibe, and even. Uh, you know, uh, there are actors, there have been British and Australian actors who have really pulled off American Westerns, and I think you're one of those guys that could do a lot of them and really do well. You just felt like, uh, you know, you just feel like you've got that, uh, again, that old-school American Western kind of vibe to you. Howard yeah. Hawks Howard Hawks would have loved you. He'd have cast you in everything. Yeah, thank you for saying that. <laughs> you know, the John Ford school of... Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, 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 I did, I've done a few mm -hmm. and I really enjoyed that shadow heart thing playing the bad guy. Mm -hmm. And I, I just decided I was going to have fake teeth that he had rotten teeth. Oh yeah, that's right. At the beginning. And then he changes them and he gets these golden teeth because he can afford it. And it's mm -hmm. all about the corruption of money and how, it, you know, what it does. And it's literally in your teeth. And so yeah. that was a lot of fun to do. But I, I was doing that Kevin Costner thing again. And, and I, I had to drive from Salt Lake City to Moab. Mm -hmm. to the location it was like a three-hour drive mm -hmm. through wilderness and i was just all the way just going oh my god people you know 200 years ago were like in these carts mm -hmm. you know crossing this desert to get to places i mean the kind of the kind of uh people these were you know i don't think they really exist anymore because you know people uh, you know, drinking Coca-Cola and eating popcorn and, you know, mm -hmm. you couldn't exist in those times. They were so hardened by the environment. And, and so it was that, you know, and I was thinking about that. And then you're sitting in Moab and you're looking at basically the face of God. Mm -hmm. And like, what does that do to a person to just be in that, you know, all day with no television and, and very little until, you know, you've got to build your hut or you know get your food go hunt or grow something mm -hmm. you know that takes up your whole time it, it, those people were not modern people but the, you know we we now go and get our stuff in plastic at the supermarket yeah you you know subsistence the world has changed subsistence yeah. is something we don't really need to worry about anymore just that basic okay well, I'm yeah, in a spot. We, we need the money to go and to go and buy it right where do i find water but, how do i get shelter but we no longer have the skills to mm -hmm. go and get it right. that's we've become sort of um you know uh, i don't know what the word is sort of almost in, infantilized by by the world yeah it's no it's, longer it's like i look around it's like i, I you know i wish i'd studied uh, how to be an engineer or, or an electrician mm -hmm. instead of doing what I did because then I would know how to fix my washing machine and my uh, uh, heating and lights and cars and you know mm -hmm. yeah th 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 that's so important in some way you know to be sufficient 
that that apocalypse now thing where Willard sitting in the hotel room saying every every minute I sit here I get weaker while Charlie squats in the woods and gets stronger and you go wow <laughs> that's America yeah, that's, that's, it. that's the Western world right now that's that's it that's the that's the <laughs> that's it there yeah. Um, I'm not because gonna... he's out of his environment. He's right. He shouldn't even be there in the jungles. That's absolutely right. Yeah. You know, I want to yeah. talk uh, next time you come on. We're going to talk about directing because I know that's something. You know, you've done some. You did a. You directed a film called Macbeth Unhinged. Um, I'm looking forward to seeing that. I haven't seen it, but um, I know. You know, when you talk to actors about directing, we were talking about Mel Gibson acting versus directing, and then doing them both. But we'll talk about that another time. But I just want people to know that. Yeah, you're. You do write. You're a poet, and you you just do a you have a you have a lot of layers to you. And I think most of my favorite actors are like that. There's no actor or actress that I like that is one dimensional. You know, the great ones always have a many faceted life. And I think you're one of those people. And you gave a you gave an off the cuff speech at the Scotland uh, Film Festival award ceremony, and uh, mm. you, you talked about the importance of independent film, both in giving a voice to new mm. filmmakers, but as a legitimate art form all on its own. You know, and mm. I thought it was very elegant, and and only a a real person who you know like a director who knows the nuts and bolts of filmmaking could could have given that speech and i heard filmmakers afterwards that saying that it meant a lot to them so good job on that score my friend that was a that was a nice moment oh yeah thank Very you good. yes yeah. that's slightly thrown to the wolves that time i was told <laughs> oh you've got to make a speech <laughs> i just called you up and you're five like, minutes before yeah, thanks man <laughs> i appreciate that <laughs> Well, that's about all the time we have for today. I actually held you a little longer than I promised, but I'm so grateful. And I could go on and on talking to you about filmmaking and acting, and I'm sure we'll have the opportunity in years to come. But if there's anything you'd like to end with or anything your fans should be looking for in the future that you'd like to talk about on any aspect of your career, or is there any website we should look at or social media? And can you give us the lowdown? Um, yeah, I mean... I'm good. Okay. <laughs> You're the best. Well, <laughs> but, uh, but, you know, let's do the, the director thing next time. Yeah, you want. yeah, we will. I'd love to have you back on. So we will do that maybe maybe in the near future. I'd like to continue this because there are some guests I have that I just I don't want to spend, you know, put out a two-hour podcast. So I do have to. I'm bringing Ann Archer back on for that same very reason because we're going to talk yeah. about screenwriting and things that we didn't get to talk on it before but but anyway thanks again peeps for listening to the Stephen savage show and remember you can find us on every podcast platform out there so please tell your friends and uh the word of mouth is really helping us and we're you know every time i look at the numbers the stats we're just growing and growing by the minute so um so let them know about this episode episode as well as the archive shows that are available so for angus mcbadden and myself Thanks for listening, and we will see you next time. Thanks so much, Angus. Appreciate it. Welcome.